Um, so it, it really gives me great pleasure to introduce you to Ross Wall. Um, I'll firstly introduce him as a very good friend of mine. Um, Ross and I um, have started working together, but I think a passion that we uh, both share is our work in developing countries in the Pacific Islands and in Asia and now lately even in the Middle East. Um, we were partners in developing asset management strategy for the Ministry of Transport in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia uh, over the past few months, <coughs> um, which was, uh, I must say, one of the highlight projects of my career so far, so it is awesome. Um, Ross has got a, a company, a consulting company that specializes in uh, infrastructure asset management. He's uh, based in Timaru, which is uh, a very well-kept secret place in New Zealand. Um, it's actually a lovely city, uh, but because it's in the South Island and there's not many people that go there, few, few of the North Islanders actually been to Timaru. Um, and then Ross also has got an online environment that he uh, pushes very hard, which is the InfraManage. So if you, if you go www.inframanage.com, you will find quite a bit of infrastructure management resources on, 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 on uh, Ross's website. So do make sure that you, that you um, visit that also. Um, Ross will be covering asset management plans today. So in terms of your assignment coming up, which I will be talking about this afternoon, uh, this is quite important. Okay, so uh, do pay attention. And then the next one is going to be on demand management. And we're going to have a tutorial on demand management before lunch. And uh, then I will look into performance reporting and management straight, straight after that. So enjoy it. Um, do ask lots of questions. Um, I think you've got roughly till about just before 12 for this two weeks, just right? Yep. That's what I have. So uh, yep. enjoy that. Ross, thank you very much for sacrificing your time. Um, like uh, with Roger Fetlow, um Roger uh, and Ross has been supporting, have been supporting my program for very long. And uh, the contribution to the education of the young people is, is really greatly appreciated. And it's such a wonderful opportunity to teach to some of you who will go all over the world back to your home countries and take the learnings from New Zealand with you. So, uh, thank you very much. Okay. We appreciate it. If you yeah. said that, it's all okay. good. Uh, Let me just switch it on. Now, if the, if the screen goes dark, yeah. you just touch the screen. Oh, there, okay. Yeah. That one should be kept on, yeah. um, on, on yellow and then right. fix that one. And okay. Just, everything cool. just starts up by itself. Right. Touch nothing else because otherwise it won't work. Yeah. But um, I'm just sitting yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. You so if I if I end up crying here, somebody will go and find you and yeah, that's and, so. and buzz me when you take the yeah. Right, yeah, cool. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Um, Thank you for the invite, uh, invite Tens. I actually really enjoy these, which is why I keep coming back. And every year, obviously, it's a new group of students. But um, one of the things, so this is me. Um, I, I have done a lot of work on asset management planning and asset management plans. Um, I do a lot of the peer reviews around New Zealand now for councils. Um, and also have been involved in writing over 100 of them. Um, I present all around the world. Uh, major conferences, um, TRB conferences in the States and 
Uh, probably the furthest I've gone is the one in Finland about six or seven years ago, which was a really interesting place to visit. Uh, and the other little thing is last year I graduated with a Master of Engineering. I have to tell you it's, it's a lovely experience graduating with a Master of Engineering from Auckland University. Um, I really enjoyed it. The thing that was particularly special for me about it was my dad who has just turned 80 um, and doesn't travel a lot. Uh, decided that he would come up to Auckland from, from Ashburn, which is just a bit north of Timaru, near to Christchurch, came up to my graduation. So my mum and my dad came up and my, two of my children came up and it was just a really nice day. Um, and it's a very good degree to have, so I would encourage you to keep going. I know it's you're in exams and assignments and all of that, that stuff, but, but it, is, it is a very um, satisfying result. Uh, and, and Tens was my supervisor for that degree, so he, um, if, you, if you thought he was tough with you, I've, I've, got, I've got, still got scars and things like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so anyway, it was, it was good. And um, my thesis, I did my, my, um, my degree by thesis, and it was around asset management for developing countries. So um, as Ten said, it's a, it's a real interest area for both him and I. Um, this project that we've just done up in Saudi has been very, very interesting for both of us and rewarding because we've actually extended international practice and we've transformed some of international practice. Um, asset management practice, and as we're going to discuss today, has been by and large developed in Anglo countries, okay? Australia, New Zealand, UK, uh, Canada, US, uh, and, and a little bit of work in South Africa. But, but a lot of the initial thinking's been done in um, Australia and New Zealand. And Anglo cultures are different from everybody else's cultures, as I'm sure you have observed while you've lived here in New Zealand. Um, we, don't, we have face in Anglo cultures, but not the same as Asian or, or Middle East, North African. And so what we, what we did was we took a, a lot of the concepts for the work in Saudi Arabia and we said, look, the way we would do them in Australia and New Zealand will not work in a culture where face is the most important thing. So how are we going to change that? And we managed to do that and it worked. And the assessments we did, we did in such a way that there was no loss of face in the assessments. And they worked very, very well. And the staff of the ministries that we were engaging with um, engaged very, very well as well. So um, it was quite a, for us, it was quite a step to go, hey, we can actually do this in a completely different cultural context and it will work okay. So. So that was why we've enjoyed it so much, because we've created something in the last five months that'll be used for decades around the world to come. So let's, let's talk about asset plans. Um, this is a diagram I've used for a while, and what the interesting thing about asset management is my background is civil engineering. I now know far more about accounting and finance and strategic planning and economics and a little bit about customer services than I ever thought I would at the start of my engineering career. And, and one of the key things that, to realise about asset management planning is it isn't just engineering. Engineering is important around managing the life cycle of assets, understanding condition performance, understanding the structural and other characteristics of those assets. But you do need to know about the economics and the accounting and finance. You do need to know about strategic and tactical planning with them as well. Uh, and, and you hold assets to deliver services, so that is really important as well. Um, and so this, the, this is a quite a key diagram. If you, if you keep that in your mind when you're thinking about asset management planning, um, that will, will do you well because, we're, because the discipline where our specialist degrees are is only one small part of it. Um, and what asset management tends to force you to do is to work with specialists from other um, subject areas and all of a sudden you have to find a common language to talk to them because they, they, they might use a word, uh, accounting's a very good example, they will use a word and we as engineers will use a word and we both think we're talking about the same thing, we're not. Um, because they're applied differently in our different disciplines. So, so it's, a, that's, it's that uh, multidisciplinary collaboration is a key part. Um, this is, this is one of Dr. Henning's slides, and it's around the, the guiding principles of road asset management. And again, um, just important to, as this is all overview stuff, we're going to dig into the contents of asset management plans soon, but it's around preservation. 
is, is what you're trying to do. So this is really the objectives of, of asset management when applied to roads particularly. Um, it is keeping the functionality of safety of existing. Uh, and it's not around particular projects. So this one was done, this slide was done for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, but it's around the entire system. So you look at, you look at um, the whole network and all the components of it, not just one particular uh, project or item. Um, what you're looking at is a total, total cost of ownership over, over the total life of the road. And, and that's where you get into that thinking about, I can build something fast and cheap, but it might only last for 10 years, or I can build it a bit better and to a much better spec and it might last 50 years. What's the best result? Um, and, uh, and the last thing is that you need a, a sustainable, and that is, uh, is an increasingly important subject. Um, sustainable in terms of the service delivery, but also sustainable in terms of um, climate adaptation and climate change. And, and the really classic example of that is um, coastal ring roads uh, on islands and things like that. Real problem up in the Pacific, because, all of, because most of the roads are around the coast. And if your coast is getting hit by large waves, tsunamis, uh, big cyclones, typhoons, those sorts of things, um, on an ever-increasing frequency, well then putting the same sort of road back for it to get wrecked in a couple of years' time might not make the best sense. And so we're starting as a profession to go, well, are there, are there different ways of doing this that make more economic and, and uh, total cost of ownership sense, given that we're in um, those types of environments? The, the other thing is, in, and again, this is Anglo versus rest of the world. So Anglo, we have this idea of fee simple title for land. So you, you own, somebody owns land, you buy and sell it, it's a, it's a commodity that has a house on it or whatever. In a lot of the world, that's not like that. The land's ancestrally or communally held, um, and, and it's not traded. It, it stays in a particular family for, for forever. So if you want some of that land for a road, because the existing road is in, is in a very vulnerable place, you have a problem because the people that own that land and it's their family's land are probably not that keen on you putting a road over it. So that's part of sustainability is, is you start running into the, all the land issues um, as well. So what are, what are asset management plans? And, and where did they start? So in New Zealand, we started writing asset management plans in 1996. And I ended up, I was working for a municipal authority at that time. Um, it had quite old assets. They had 100-year-old assets. So uh, Timaru, where I live, was where I was working. And um, it was settled quite early, and they put wastewater and water systems in quite early. And, and they were all coming up to, to the end of their life. Um, and at the same time, the government um, passed a law that said, hey, you need to do better long-term planning for, for public assets. And so I got right at the very beginning days of asset management planning in New Zealand, I was writing asset plans and, and have been involved since. Um, so what you're trying to do is talk about how do you manage the total life of an asset in, in, a, in a, the most effective way, delivering the services that are required, all those sorts of things. And so an asset management plan is just a structured plan to do that. Um, the, the thing about asset management plans is we've over the last 20 plus years that we've been writing them, we've had all sorts of goes at different formats. There's been lots of innovation trying to get a, an ideal format. The, the um, chapter headings that I'm going to describe to you today are where we've settled after about 20 years of experimenting. And even then, um, Dr. Henning and I, when we're doing this work up in Saudi, said, oh, look, hang on, we actually had another look at the, the worldwide expertise and, and um, data on asset plans and said, we need to change what the, what, and extend what is the, the current um, structure because the world's changed again. Okay, so, and we'll dig into that. Um, the, in terms of the 20 years, we've had, the, the, we started almost where we are at the moment. We went to um, very brief front to the plan and massive big appendices, so three, 400 page documents with lots and lots of data in the appendices. We've now come back to a, a merge between that, so you put detailed technical data and appendices and a bit more information in the bulk of the plan. But the, the thing is that 
there's no exactly right or wrong way to write them. Uh, the structure that I'll present to you is, is a reasonable way of describing the issues that you have to, to talk about, um, but they're flexible enough that you can add and, add and take little bits from them depending on the situation that you're working in. As I said, we've, we're on our eighth cycle of plans at the moment and next year is New Zealand has a, a three-year cycle for asset management plan writing. Why would that be, do you think? That, that we write asset management plans every three years in New Zealand? Elections, yeah. So, so I, was, I was talking in the States and they had read the New Zealand material and I said, we can't understand why you do three years. I said, what's your election cycle? They said, four years. I said, well, you'd write them for four years in the States. I went, oh, oh, that makes sense. In the UK, five years. In China, for instance, where you have the five yearly congresses, if you were writing asset plans in China, you would line them up with the big political congresses. So, the reason that the rewrite or the revision term is around the political cycle, essentially, in any given place. Um, because you, you, in New Zealand, we, we get them written prior to a, a new council coming in, and then the new council comes in and ratifies or changes. Um, so this year's council election, uh, and next year we rewrite the asset plans, and the year after that they reset the long-term plans. So the new council's had 18 months in, in office by the time they're resetting the long-term, and they get a bit of input into the rewrite next year. So the, the thing is, the, the practice from Australia and New Zealand has now gone right around the world. Um, in fairness, the Australians probably had the first hack at it, at the, uh, or the first um, attempt at writing asset plans in the early 90s for the same reasons that we did in New Zealand, in that we had assets coming towards the end of life that needed to be managed a whole lot better. It's now become um, quite an accepted international practice, and you have an international standards organisation, ISO 55000, um, and you also have the International Infrastructure Management Manual. So these two here are the, are the, the main two documents. Um, and then this was, I just dragged everything off our bookshelves, put them on a table and took a, took a photo. So there's all sorts of practice notes and individual guides and, and industry templates. So in New Zealand, the TEC is Tertiary Education Committee. CAM is the Capital, capital Asset Management that Tre New Zealand Treasury puts out, the government departments. So what tends to happen, the electricity sector in New Zealand has its own format specified within its legislation as well. So you tend to have industry specific guidance or you tend to have whole of government, so like the CAM um, for all the government departments and then the tertiary education which is universities, polytechs and they, they, they have their own one which is slightly adapted. Um, so when you're looking for resources, if you're working in a particular sector or industry, um, you would go and look to see what the template is for that in industry and work with that. If you're working internationally in a place where there is no template, you would start with probably the ISO and the International Infrastructure Management Manual, which have been aligned to each other. So the 2015 revision of this lined up with the ISO, which was published in 2014. Okay. So, that, so there are lots and lots of resources available, almost to the point where there's so much resources you would never look at them all and you get... Um, you, tend to, you tend to, once you know the main ones, you tend to just go and grab a particular practice note if you're dealing with that particular issue and, re, and remind yourself of it. This diagram here, which is actually from WSP Opus, um, some work they did, uh, just to acknowledge them, um, is actually an adaptation of figure B1 from appendix of the ISO. And what it does is it shows the interrelationships between all the documentation within the asset management practice. So at the top, and this is organisational plans and objectives, so that might be a municipality or it might be a, a government department or it might be a whole country. Um, who have will have national or departmental or, or um, uh, visions and objectives and plans. It says this is what we're trying to do for the next um, 20, 30 years. Um, a, a very good example of done uh, asset management plans in the Pacific, and uh, most of the Pacific Islands now have 15 year, broken up into five year blocks, national strategy plans. Um, that's the starting point. Um, we go, right, well that's what, that's what the government's saying that it wants to achieve over the next 15 years, to have the assets that they've got line up with that. 
Um, up in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the, they have the Vision 2030, which the government's put out. So that's a big, this is what the government of Saudi Arabia is trying to achieve by 2030. Um, and so, so again, we were able to start with that. So well, if, that's the, if that's the objectives of the government, now what do, what do we need to do from an asset um, planning point of view to deliver that? Um, sitting under that, you have strategic asset management plan uh, with asset management objectives and an asset management policy at that level. Um, and for a lot of places, maybe a strategic asset plan is all that you need. It's quite a high level document, maybe 50, 60, pages long, that's the starting point. Um, that's what you would do first if you were starting from scratch. And then down in here you have individual asset management plans. They can be very detailed. They typically buy asset class or type. Uh, so in the transportation sense, you'll have a, a roading asset management plan and then a municipality might have a water one and a wastewater one and stuff like that. And in the roading one, you'd have separate sections for surfaces, um, bridges, uh, um, retaining walls and, and other stuff like that, maybe your signals and, um, and signage might be in another section as well. So you're, you're breaking it up by asset class. Um, then down here you have your implementation. You've got um, relevant support systems over here. Uh, come down into your asset portfolio. Then you have performance evaluation and uh, improvements with Dr Henning again is talking to you about this afternoon. Come back up into um, how, what do we need to do to go forward, feed that back in and around you go. It, because the thing is with asset management planning, even on our eighth cycle in New Zealand, um, they're never finished because what people want changes and the state of the asset changes and you never have complete information. So, um, so when I naively, when I started writing asset plans in 1996 and I finished my first ones in late, late 1997, I thought, oh cool. That's great, done that, possibly happy I can go back to real engineering, which in my mind meant building roads and war supplies and treatment plants and things like that. Well, I've never got back to real engineering. Um, because then they went, oh, there's so much stuff we don't know, we want to do this. And about then I went, well, if I'm going to be working 60 hours a week, I might as well be a consultant. <laughs> so I went consulting back then and have been busy on that stuff ever since. Um, but anyway, so, so asset plans and strategic asset plans fit there. That's the ISO outline. Um, this is the IIMM structure, and, and it has these three major sections, and, and they translate into asset management plans. So the section two, if you like, is the understanding requirements. Um, and so it's your direction, your service levels, your forecasting demand, yeah, what do you know? Your asset knowledge and your monitoring asset condition performance, all in section two. Section three is your life cycle planning. Um, and each of these, these headings here are, are the subheadings in the IIMM. But essentially, and I think this is worth noting, that these sections pretty much form the, the list of sections that you would expect in an asset management plan. So if you're writing an asset management plan, you go, right, oh, I need levels of service, you can go to section 2.2 of the, of the International Infrastructure Management Manual and it will tell you about levels of service. Um, so in, in life cycle planning, um, you, you have uh, what, what sort of materials you've got and um, how you, how, what sort of decisions you're making around those, so your decisions, your risks, your operational planning, your capital investment, um, your financial planning and in operational planning you might be, between that and the capital, you're also looking at asset replacement and renewal as well. And then over on this side is um, the enablers, which is how, what, what teams you're employing to, to do the asset management, your asset plan, any management systems you have in place, and that includes quality management systems, um, your information systems and tools, yeah, service delivery models, so that's how if you're contracting out or if you've got your own forces or how, you, how you're actually delivering the service, uh, and then your audit and improvement. Now, that's IIMM as it exists right now, 2015 edition. The work that um, TENS and I did, we said, hey, up here at levels of service, really probably we should split legislation out. Um, and we should have legislation, because legislation actually f provides the... the the baseline and you, that's what you have to deliver. 
as opposed to some levels of service can be optional. And, and in many, many parts of the world, not, not so much New Zealand, because we tend to go, oh yeah, it's a law, yeah, yeah okay, we might, we might obey it if we, if we decide it's a good idea. In most parts of the world, the law is the law and you, and you do what it says. Um, so so uh, that, that was one. The other one that we, we felt needed to be added, um, probably in this area, is around sustainability. Um, and again, climate adaptation and uh, sustainability initiatives. Um, and the other one is safety and security. Um, so up until very recently, probably hasn't been top of mind in New Zealand. Uh, in lots of places in the world, safety and security is, is a very important topic around assets. Um, and so the, the thing is that, that, that again, you would probably um, maybe fit that in, in this area somewhere. And then over here, um, the, in, in splitting out the asset information systems and tools, there also needs to be asset information strategy. There's a growing recognition that your data and your information is actually quite a valuable asset in itself and needs um, a management strategy for that on its own. So just to wrap that up, we have actually suggested that back to the committee that looks after the IIMM and said, hey, that's what we, we think um, needs to go in. So to get to that point, we looked at ISO 55000, we looked at IIMM 2015, we looked at the infrastructure, uh, sorry, Institute of Asset Management UK guidance on asset management and quality systems, and we looked at ASHTO's guidance as well. So we basically took a, a sampling of the worldwide guidance on this, pulled it all together and said, yeah, that, that's how it fits. Um, so that, that's those possible additions there. Um, and uh, this, I haven't put sustainability there because it's already in this diagram. So this is, this is uh, at the moment what my practice is using is um, uh, basically the section headings for an asset management plan um, and I think again just to, to give you a heads up on this it's it's if you understand these sections and the the section what's in them I think that gives you a very very good conceptual framework if you were to ever in a business and where you were writing an asset plan from scratch or you were updating one you can look at this information you can go right uh, is it, uh, are each of these sections already in the asset plan? If they're missing, why are they missing? Sometimes a section will be missing simply because the information's not there in the place that you're writing, writing the plan. Um, and so what you can do in that case is just go, right, well, hey, that's a, on an improvement item, we will deal with that next time around or whatever. So every, every good plan, these, these plans are often in excess of 100 pages. So. Um, Senior decision makers uh, are not going to read 100 page plans. You're lucky if they read two, three or four pages. So you need an executive summary which just summarises everything up and, and hits the, the key points. So what you're, what you're aiming, you're, um, one, one of the things that I've found quite useful over the last few years when writing plans or writing reports is to say, who is the audience? And, and each plan has multiple audiences um, for these. So the audiences will be politicians, they will be uh, senior decision makers in an organisation. Um, they might be auditors, uh, and then they might be uh, the public and also the technical staff who are using the plan. Now, in terms of the executive summary, your audience that you're aiming for is, is politicians and senior decision makers. So it needs to be short, it needs to be brief, and it needs to be really on point. Um, they're the hardest things to write. You know, it's easy to write a two, three hundred page document because you're just biffing information and references and, oh, there it is. And then you can, you can summarise that down to five pages. That's where, that's where it gets a little bit um, gritty because what do you leave in, what do you leave out and what are, you, uh, what, what are the key messages that you're trying to transmit? Um, and so that's, that is actually a really good challenge. The same with research. You know, if you're writing a research thesis, you write all the stuff, you do all the interviews, you do, you do all the research, all the calculations, and then you've got to go, well, actually, what's the message I'm trying to tell here? Same thing. So, and that's what forces you to look at all the information and say, well, am I actually telling a story, or is it just a whole heap of information that I've dumped in? And hopefully you're telling a story in an, in an AMP and also in a research paper. Um, so then you come down to introduction, section two. 
And so what you're doing with the introduction is just saying, look, what, what, it's just the big overview. What, why, why are we writing this plan? Uh, what's the entity? Is it a ministry of transport or is it is a whole of government? Um, is it, so an example is Nui, uh, which is we've done an asset plan for both Nui and Tokelau in the last five years. And they don't have one, they're small island states, so they just have one for the whole of government. So the entity is the government of Nui or the, or the government of Tokelau. Um, and, and then all the assets um, sitting underneath that. So it's just who, who is it for, what, what's the broad range of assets, uh, why if there's maybe there's a particular piece of legislation that says you must do this, you know, what, what's the rationale for doing it. So that's just setting that big picture in the introduction. Come, whoop, come down to the description of the service and this is um, what is the activity and what is the issues and what, what sort of, what are the, what's the main assets. So um, it's quite instructive, it's high level summary stuff but often, uh, like I'm just thinking about uh, asset management strategy that Tens and I did for um, the government of Sierra Leone for their roads and they've had awful trouble as a country, they had a big civil war, that was the blood diamonds and all that sort of stuff. But they've got, I think it was about 8,000 kilometres of sealed roads. Um, some of them are, are okay, and, and there's some bridges over some fairly large rivers, um, but not much, and then a whole heap of um, un, unsealed roads. And, and, but the really interesting thing was not very many linking roads into the village and the agricultural areas. And so when you did the, the summary of the whole country and looked at all the roads, you go, oh, there's a whole heap of roads missing that you would expect. Um, and, then, and then for them as well, when you looked at the, the sealed roads, they'd all been put in by the British in the, in the colonial period to extract resources from diamond mines and bauxite and iron ore and all these sorts of things. And you go, well, if you're actually building roads for Sierra Leone, for it to prosper its own country, you'd probably go, eh, British colonial extractive roads are probably not the only roads that we'd want. Um, and so we were able to look at that. So this is just this description of service. Look at that and go, yeah, this is what you got, but there's a whole heap of stuff missing. A um, whole heap of linking roads. Because, because, you know, in all fairness to the British colonial um, administration and around the world, they weren't overly interested in what the general population felt about the roading system. They were just interested in getting whatever they were getting out at the time. Um, and so, yeah, so we were able to put up a strategy that said, look, look after the roads that you've got at the moment, but you need to build a whole lot of different ones as well. So that's, that's your description of service. What do we got and how well does it sort of fit with what we need to be doing? Come down into levels of service, and this is also performance measures, and that's what are we delivering? And, and we'll dig into levels of service in, in a, further on in this lecture. But as an overview, you're saying, well, what are we actually, we've got these assets, but they're not there by chance. What, are we, what have we got them for? So if it's, if it's transport assets, it's around mobility and it's around connectivity and journeys and getting produce to market and all of those sorts of things. If it's a water supply network, it's, you know, the primary reason is to get water to people and it's got to be safe. You don't want to kill people with the water you're delivering. Um, with wastewater network, it's around protecting people from disease and protecting the environment. Um, stormwater networks, it's around protecting people and property. So, so the, those at a very high level are your service levels, and then there'll be a whole heap of measures under those that, that the organisation might be um, keeping a track of. Now, some of those will be legislated and some of them will have been adopted by the organisation, and, and that's where that that legislation um, split out we, we think is quite important because if the legislation says you shall do this, this and this, then as an organisation you shall be doing this, this and this and hopefully you've got funding to do it. Um, but, but otherwise, uh, if you don't know that as an organisation you could be not meeting the legislation that you're required to. Um, so. But what you're trying to do with levels of service is you're trying to describe the service that's being delivered, why it's being delivered, and how it meets the, the high-level organisational objectives right up there. Um, 
come down, you have strategy, goals, objectives, procedures. So that's just, um, lo there's lots of, always lots of national, regional, local policies and plans, legislations, bylaws, standards and things like that all apply to big assets. So um, that's just a collation of that sort of stuff that says, because they tend to tear, layer down on each other and they can get quite, the interrelationships between policies, legislation, regulations, that can get quite interesting. Um, you'd like to think they're all well thought out, but they're not often. They're often the different stuff's been developed at different times. So um, that's just a, a good place to describe all of that. Then you're into demand and planning for the future. Um, asset management is interesting and asset management planning is interesting in that you are dealing with what you've got right now. So whatever assets you've got at the point you're doing the plan, that's what you've got. But, but assets have very long lives. So bridges are 100 years. Um, Hydroelectric dams can be a thousand plus years. Uh, uh, water pipes can be a hundred to two hundred years. So, so you're also looking forward a long way as well. Um, and, and it's difficult because if you look back a hundred years and say, what was the world like a hundred years ago? Who would be going to look forward a hundred years and say, what is the world going to be like in a hundred years time? Particularly with climate um, changes and uh, all the issues around that. So, but you can look forward 10, 15, 20, 30 years. In New Zealand, for municipal, we're required to do 30-year forward projections now. Um, 10 to 15 years is reasonable. And so, look, what have we got? What do we need by, based on the changes? And we're going to talk about that in the second lecture. Demand is quite a, it's a topic I really enjoy, so hopefully you'll enjoy it by the end of it as well. Then we've got sustainability, and that's around uh, sustainability. Now, that can be... Often when you talk about sustainability, people just think about environmental sustainability or climate, but it's also around material sustainability. It's around applying sustainability um, principles to how you build things. So, you know, green buildings or um, recycled materials for road building, things like that. Importantly, as we'll find out as well, um, sustainability is also about people. Um, one of the things that dropped out of my research uh, for my master's was, and, and I look, it was particularly in the Pacific, um, they have very good people on projects, but when the project finishes, it happens in Middle East North Africa as well. So you have a big project, build some stuff, that project finishes, work's gone. So the very good people then go somewhere else to do the next project. And you have this issue that, that there's not people there to maintain and, and uh, look after the assets longer term because um, the people tend to follow the projects. And you go, okay, well that's actually not sustainable, is it? Um, what that does and what that says is we build a project and it breaks and then we'll build another one. Um, and, and you don't have to look very far to see that pattern behavior right across the world. But a lot of it's around sustainability of people resources. Um, the world is very, very short of good engineers and experienced engineers, which is great news for all of you because you're all going to be in a high demand occupation that's shorter resources, which all means you're going to get paid squillions of dollars more than I ever got paid in my career. You're going to have long and satisfying careers. You're going to have some of the most interesting work in the world. Um, the bad news is you're very unlikely to be allowed to retire, so you're probably going to work to your 90. So just as long as you've got that in your mind, um, you'll be fine. You'll earn heaps, but you're never going to be able to enjoy it. So. Um, <laughs> no, it's not that bad, but uh, there, there is certainly a huge, and we're going to look at that in the demand, uh, a huge upcoming demand for engineers. So Then you would move to life cycle management. This is actually the heart of it. So this is looking at all the assets you've got and saying, right, how do we, how do we best manage the total op op cost of ownership of those assets? Um, and we also have to take into account risks. So these two fit together very importantly because the decisions not to do things can create just as much risk as the decisions to do things. And, and the example is, let's say I've got a bridge. Actually, we'll, we'll use an example in New Zealand. We have a bridge called the Mohaka Bridge, which is between Napier and Taupo. It's a main tr freight route. The bridge is on the bottom of a, of a very large sort of comes down like that and up, it's the bottom of, out of a gorge. It's an awfully long way down from the bridge down to the gorge. That bridge is getting pretty old. The, the alternate route's about five or six hours. So, because if you wanted to go north from Napier, you'd have to go right round to Palmerston North, basically, and then go north up through um, 
sorry, the desert plateau and then round, round Lake Taupo to get back to the same point. That's the alternate route. It's a long way around. And, and for a long time, so, so what, what you go, oh, okay, so we've got a super critical bridge, it's really important, if it drops into the river, we've got problems. But it's very expensive to replace. So, so there's all sort, been all sorts of studies on it, and everybody thinks we can get a bit more life out of it, and we can slow the trucks down coming onto it, and all those good things. But sooner or later, that bridge is going to break. And, and about that time, we go, oh, well, perhaps we'd better, we'd better fix that. Um, the Manawatu Gorge is another example of that, where the whole hill's come down and now we've got this really hopeless bit of road over Saddle Road and it'll be another four or five years before they rebuild the, the alternate for the gorge road, 10 years or 15 years after the problem. That's, that's how good we are in New Zealand. We leave, it to the last, we leave it past the last minute and then we fix things, so don't think we're that good. But it's all about money and it's all about people can't see the need until it's broken. And asset management and asset management plans is about trying to do a little bit better than that. Um, and, but but the, the risk of doing nothing is still a risk, because the risk of doing nothing is you can lose service altogether um, or impose very costly alternatives on people. So, so you've got this, how do we manage the life cycle? How do we manage risk? And so risks are, are, are multiple as well. It can be natural hazards and earthquakes and disasters and things like that. It can be risks around people, it can be risks around um, deterioration, con deteriorating condition and performance of assets, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and it can be risks around process as well, sometimes particularly in public water supply. If you don't have the right processes and quality in place, you will end up serving people bad water, which will make them sick. Um, then you describe your processes and your practices Asset management is, is always improvement um, and implementation, so you always have stuff to do and there's always stuff you don't know that you, or, you, or you aren't doing that you need to improve. Then we have a section on financials which says here's our projections for the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years, depending on the period you're looking at. Um, and, and you put in, if, we're, if we've got to build a whole lot of new assets because there's a whole lot of growth going on or, or we've got some very old assets that need to be replaced, you have the costs of those in there, plus the cost of maintaining and operating the existing assets. And then you will have um, your appendices, which you put all your detailed information or reference information, whatever you want to link. So that is the basic structure and section of an asset management plan. Um, we're going to just go through some steps around that as well. That's based on my experience over the last 20 years. Um, we're going to look at, I did a, did a paper called Simplifying Asset Management back in 2015 um, that won best paper at the international conference. Um, the Australians gave me, the, it was a, even though the conference was in New Zealand, it was a, an Australian conference and the Australians gave me a best paper. If you if you follow cricket at all, it would be like the Australian cricketers saying to New Zealand, "Oh, you're the best." <laughs> so it was good. It was a very nice one to win. Um, but the thing is with asset management, this is the inside of a lighthouse. And and the thing is to remember with asset planning and asset management plans, is it's iterative and it's a spiral of understanding. So you can be down here, and you and you climbing up and up and up, <clears throat> but you you never finish because things always change. <coughs> So this was, this was um, all, I looked at all those manuals that I, had, uh, that I gave you the photo of earlier and I went, okay, this is getting too, com we're making this too complicated. So I thought, right, how do you, how do you make things simpler? And, and I looked up some things on simplicity and it's interesting, Albert Einstein had a quote that said, make everything as simple as possible, but not simpler. And, and it's a very, very good thought pattern to go down because there's no parameters there. You've got to decide what as simple as possible is and you've got to decide what not simpler is. And what you find out is that simplifying things is actually harder, much, much harder than making them more complicated. Um, if you want, if you, in, your, in your masters, if you, if you have a flash of brilliance and you take all your complicated analysis and research and you present it very simply, that's the A+. Plus. Because to simplify demonstrates mastery of the topic. Okay? If you, if you have mastered a topic, you can simplify it. 
Um, so it's a really good challenge, and, and, and it's a good challenge in your working life as well. Um, any fool can make things more complicated. So that, that's, that's the, the other side of that. But, but to take a very complex topic and simplify it is a very, very good challenge for any engineer. Um, so here's, here's simplified. Sitting under asset management planning and asset management plans, you need an asset inventory or register. So that is a list of all the assets that you're dealing with, their condition, perhaps their performance, their multiple looks at their condition so you can work out what the deterioration is. If you do not have this, the rest of this is all guesswork to a large extent. So this absolutely underpins good asset management. And it is something that everybody struggles with. Because go back to 1996, I built, we, didn't, we were only just starting to use big databases in those days. I was as keen as mustard. I built this database, I made, I had a whole team putting stuff in, I was quality checking it, I was making sure it was all good. Great. I, I then got on to do other things. And somebody else gets the job of maintaining that. And maybe they're not quite as keen and maybe it's just a job and maybe nobody's told them what, how important it is. And, over time, the organisation goes, oh, they're just putting data into database. We'll pay them the minimum wage, you know. And so instead of having somebody that's very keen, very knows how important it is, you end up with somebody on the minimum wage whose choice was, do I work at McDonald's or do I work at the municipality putting data into a database? You're probably going to get a better result from McDonald's. At least they have systems and processes to make sure that your burgers are semi-OK. So... Um, so the thing is, that's a, that's a very key underpinning, and, and all the rest of the information that we're looking at assumes that you've got a decent asset inventory. Over here on this side, you've got these four big headings, levels of service, future demand, and risk. In the centre of this, you've got your life cycle management. So this is the heart of asset management and your asset management plan. What am I doing with operations? What am I doing with maintenance? What am I doing with asset renewal, replacement, rehabilitation? What new assets do I need? How am I disposing of assets and when? How do I optimise that? You obviously need a pretty good inventory and condition register to do that, but that's the heart of it. But you need to know what you're aiming for, the levels of service. You need to know what the future demand of your assets are and you need to know the risks that you're carrying or you're going to run into to be able to make good decisions around all of this stuff. Then you have financials. Now, when I, even when I was first writing asset management plans, I used to think of financials in terms of money I had to spend on the assets I was looking after. Operations and maintenance renewals capital and then these accounts produce a single depreciation. And that was as far, that was, I didn't, I, I didn't think about the other side of it um, at all, which is revenue. We'll talk about that in a second. So I would go, oh, I, I don't have or I do have enough money to spend as far as I'm concerned. There is another side to this, which is called revenue. And you get money from fees, charges, tariffs, loans, grants, funding, bonds, um, rates in New Zealand, but depending on where you are in the world. And that, long run, has to match that. And that is a problem, because infrastructure is expensive. So you need to know about all of these components to write an asset plan and to understand the tension and the trade-offs in asset management planning. The minute you start looking at these, you find that there's actually a gap. The service level you're providing is not actually what the government requires of you or, or the public or whoever require of you. It's below. Very, very occasionally it's above, but most of the time it's below. And you go, oh, OK, well, to do that, we'd need to build some more assets and need some more money. You look at future demand and you go, oh, goodness, that could be a big change as well. There's a gap in our understanding or there's a gap in the demand. Or um, In New Zealand terms, we have this constant tension because Auckland is sucking the country's population in, as well as half the world, not half the world's, but lots of people come to Auckland. So there's a constant growth going on in, in Auckland, which is this future demand. There's a gap between existing assets and what there might be. And, and, and the lack of public transport systems in this city compared with anywhere else in the world would be a really good example of that. New Zealand started talking about putting public transport light rail systems into Auckland in the mid-1960s. 
just as just for your information, which was which was about when I was born. So you know, it's it's over 50 years ago that, that they were talking about that, and um, we're only just starting to get that rail loop. And that's not even a yeah, that's that's just the start. Um, for a city this size, it's it's pathetic. But anyway, that's that's by the by, that's a gap between service levels and based on future demand. And when you start looking at risks, you realise that you've got a lot more risks than you ever thought you did, and there'll be a gap in how you, you meet them. Um, and so there's a gap there. So what happens is you put all this stuff through, you put it through your life cycle management, total cost of ownership analysis, and you come over here and you say, we need lots of money. And everyone goes, yeah, yeah, no, you do. No, that's, that's really important. Yeah, all the stuff you've talked about we can see it, we know that we need to build more rail, we know we need more, we know we need more roads, we know that we need to deal with congestion charging in Auckland so less people bring cars into town, we know this, but there's no money. So just make do with what you've got, is, that's how it works. Um, but that starts a discussion. If, you, if that's definitely what you need and, and you've got half the money, um, what, what it means is people say, well, can you make do? Well, making do means one of these has to change. Okay? If, if your life cycle management analysis is good, and that's, that's actually the most concrete part of it, because you, you, you know the assets you've got, you can measure the condition, you can measure the deterioration, you can work out when they're going to fail, structurally, but also whether they're going to fail capacity-wise, because you've got a, a reasonable idea. So you come back here and you say, well, do you want the same level of service? Of course, no, we want more but no more money. Have we got the future demand right? Yeah, 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 no, no, look, Auckland's growing that fast. So what's going to happen? Our risks are going to go up. Risk of capacity failure, risk of structural failure, risk of early deterioration. That's what happens. So that's a, that becomes a very political discussion. And, but as engineers, and particularly um, as you work into your careers and things like that, where you will be in management roles advising politicians and senior CEOs and things like that, you have to con coherently make this, this, make this argument because otherwise you won't get the expenditure. And if somebody says there's no money, as somebody definitely will, well, why are we changing? And, and the discussion almost always comes back to risk. And, and engineering as a profession, we understand risk well enough, but most other professions don't have a very good understanding of risk. And, and, but they're very good when something collapses or fails. Oh, you never told us, you engineers. <laughs> so, so it's be aware of it. There, there is a cycle that you need to review because there's always this tension between expenditure and revenue, and there's always this tension between levels of service, demand, and risk. So just to summarise the AMPS, it is an excellent framework. It's had 20 years of plus of development. It works well for describing this. It allows you to, to an analyse and um, describe management strategies. Um, you have to implement it. There's no, I have written ones where the client went, oh, good, that gets me a, a, an audit compliance tick put on shelf. I try not to work for people like that anymore because spending a few months of my life writing something that's never going to be read is... They still pay me, but it's not very satisfying. So, um, and if it doesn't get implemented, it becomes just another document. An expensive document, you know, $100,000 expensive document, but what's the point? Um, apart from the fact that, and certainly in the Pacific Islands and, and even up in... Um, this recent job up in Riyadh, you write a strategy or an asset plan, then it informs the decision makers around voting uh, or, or going and getting money to, to, to change things. So it is useful from that point of view. But there's a lot more you can get out of AMPS than that. So I'm just going to dig in now into service levels a little bit. This is from the New Zealand um, One Network Road classification. The heading is right road, right value, right time. So go back a few years, every single... Um, Council in New Zealand looks after roads as a road controlling authority. Every council had its own set of service levels and its own hierarchy of roads. And then you had the, the national roads, the state highways as well, and the motorways. Okay? And so what was happening was that the councils that had, were in more economically prosperous areas 
on good road building country, who knew the value of good roads, ended up with excellent roads, ended up with farm tracks that were better than some arterial roads in other parts of the country. Um, and some parts of the country, east coast, central North Island, where you're on very poor soils that slip out a lot and perhaps not as economically prosperous, the roads were getting worse and worse. What the, what the industry as a whole, led by NZTA, have done is said, really in New Zealand, the person who hops in a car or a truck and drives from one end of New Zealand to another doesn't really care which council they're in. It's irrelevant. But they do care where they're on a, on a regional arterial road and all of a sudden the standard changes. And, and they're going, why am I on this road that's got all these potholes and rutting and it's hopeless. So they've introduced this thing called the One Network Road Classification. And the theory is, it doesn't matter where you are in New Zealand, if you're on a secondary collector road, the standard should be the same. So it's a pretty good theory. Um, so how they define it is they say, look, what's the traffic volumes? How much heavy traffic it's got? Um, is, it, is it access to a thing like a port or an airport? And ended up with this classification from national, regional, arterial, primary collector, secondary collector, and access. And then they've got local access as well as come in since that as well. Um, and, and what every road controlling authority has had to do has had to classify all their roads by this, these service levels, which are set by this sort of stuff, uh, or sorry, by this hierarchy, and then funding is going to follow the hierarchy as well. So you're not going to get, if you've only got primary collectors, you're not going to get funded for a regional road um, at that level. And in some parts of the country, that's going to mean that over time you do less maintenance on the existing roads, and they'll, that secondary collector might drop down from its current standard to, to the main standard. And in some cases, arterials or regionals are going to come up. So that's, that's also happening. So this is what's called a functional road classification as opposed to the old hierarchical road classification. And, and it's functional because it's looking at all of these different functions. Now, if you want to look at more at that, you can go and have a look on the NZTA site. Just put ONRC1 network road classification and you'll pull up this graphic and associated materials. Okay. Um, interestingly enough, our firm is actually a sub-consulting to an Australian firm to help the Australian Commonwealth Government and States do the same thing right now for Australia over the next couple of years. And Dr Henning and I are going to do the same thing up in Saudi Arabia in the next uh, 12 months. So it's becoming a uh, uh, part of practice spreading out from here again. In, um, that's Mount Cook in the South Island, by the way. Um, I took that photo from the dock centre. If you're ever wanting to go to a very gorgeous part of New Zealand, just thought I'd put that in there. I'm, I'm trying to get you to come down to the South Island and spend your money there, OK? So anyway, in the, in the one network road class service levels, so you've got that, that functional hierarchy. The service levels that they've got is that the road must be value for money, safe, resilient, provide the amenity value, so, so it's, you know, it's gets you to where you want it to and it's not got um, lots of uh, rough, it's not overly rough and stuff like that. Travel time reliability, and see now that, that one, just thinking about Auckland, you don't know, do you? You know, um, you can leave Albany, I was talking to um, one of our students this morning, you know, and, and it might only take you 30 minutes or it might take you an hour and a half. Or if, it's, or if somebody's decided to have a crash on the Harbour Bridge, it might take you two hours to come over to here. That's travel time reliability. And the problem with travel time reliability is if you don't have it, you have to allow the maximum reasonable time to get to an appointment or whatever. So that's wasting your time that you might otherwise be doing things. Um, interestingly, I live in Timaru. It's two hours neat from Christchurch Airport, which I often fly out of. And, and within five minutes, either way, it can be two hours, except for the last year and a half, because I've been building a new motorway south of Christchurch, and sometimes it's been two and a half hours. So I've been allowing two and a half, because if you, if you get there late, the, the planes don't wait for you just because you're stuck in traffic. Um, yesterday, I got through it too. Two hours, right on, bang. Yeah, okay, so if we're getting back to that, then, then I don't have to leave an, a half an hour earlier. 
So, so that's, that's what that travel time reliability and accessibility is just making sure you can get to, to where you want to go. So this is around the importance of the road and the risks that you're carrying. If you, if you lose a single access road, eh, it's an inconvenience for the few people that are on it. If you lose a national highway, that's a much bigger problem. Um, yeah, there might be 20, 30, 50, 100,000 vehicles a day going over that. So, plus. Um, and then this is about what you're trying to achieve, so the, the service level categories. Just looking at, um, at utilities other than roads. So, in utilities, uh, this is just down the, the bay in Timaru, another photo. Um, just beautiful, calm sunset. This is what winter's like. It's a bit cold, but it's, you know, it's, it's still and it doesn't rain too much, and sunny days, and very. It's why we're so cheerful down there, no rain. So, um, but anyway, the, what you're trying to achieve with utilities is safeguarding public health and safety. Um, managing environmental impacts, you want to be responding to issues, breaks or otherwise um, leaks in your system. You want to provide customer satisfaction and you want to do that for a price that people can afford. Uh, but as we found out recently with the Havelock North water incident in New Zealand, if you don't achieve that, you're not going to achieve that. Because, because they were running, yeah, and, I, and I've done a lot of work, I did Hastings District as a client, and I've been doing a lot of work in behind the scenes with them, and they've been responding very, very well to that incident. But they're also spending another 50 million bucks on their water supply to bring it to upgrade it, that they hadn't been planning on. So in terms of their long, yeah, it's a big, it's a big bump in their expenditure. The other thing to think about um, with assets is, particularly bridges, you can have iconic or specialty assets. Uh, heritage assets would be an example. Um, uh, iconic bridges like this um, and uh, those sorts of things particularly, and they don't get managed the same as other assets. You have to treat them on their own, essentially. So this one here, which is a, this is a cycleway and footbridge. It won best, the year it was built, it won best small bridge in the world in, a, in, an, in an international qualification, uh, quant, uh, competition. And, it's, and the main structural, it's got a structural uh, member there, and then the other one's this arc, and it's tied with this. So it's a very, it's almost an upside down structure, which is really, really interesting. Everybody goes there to take photos. Now, the thing is, you're not going to let that get all rusty and horrible and unclean and, and broken because it's, it's something that everybody's going to. So, so this bridge is going to have um, a very, very high ongoing operations and maintenance cost. Um, also, when they built it, and they got, they got funding from the local power company and from public and stuff like that, but I think it was about $8 million. And it's a foot and cycle bridge. And if you'd built a normal foot and cycle bridge over this little uh, inlet from the sea. Uh, maybe half a million dollars might have been absolute tops. So it was very expensive as well. Um, and so when you come to replace it, are you going to replace it with the same thing? Probably, if it gets to that point of needing that. So it's its, it's, its own little um, special case. And so when you're doing your asset planning and when you're doing your service levels, don't be afraid to break out specialist assets and say, right, actually they're on their own. Um, they, we will deal with them quite differently to the rest of the network. And this one's the, the new Boston one. And again, it's iconic, you know, it's, it's, it's postcard stuff. It's, it's the sort of stuff if you go, if I think of that city, I think of this particular civil infrastructure, a bridge or the Sydney Opera House or um, the, the Burj Khalifa, or you know, the, those sorts of things have different um, maintenance and operation cycles than normal assets, just because they're iconic and they, everybody cares about them. Eiffel Tower, that sort of thing. Right. At the heart of asset management, I alluded to it before, is this levels of service cost risk diagram. Now, in the last few years, there's been a, some work done by Auckland Transport and Auckland University around trying to model this. It's a hard thing to model. But the theory is you're trying to achieve a level of service 
and you, and you spend some money to do that. And in theory, that's your change axis. Access. And if you spend less dollars over a significant amount of time, your level of service ultimately will drop. But hopefully, if you spend a lot more dollars over a period of time, your service levels would, would come up a bit. What the problem is, is risk sitting over here. And it's hidden. And what tends to happen, it's like the, the children's playground balance board. You know, you've got a thing like that. When you push one down, something else comes up. You push dollars and service levels down, what comes up is risk. But you can't see it until it bites you. Um, and, and it's something, I, and the reason I'm explaining this to you, because when you're doing asset management planning and when you're doing asset management practice, this is the absolute heart of it. If you get an understanding of what's happening here, you'll be a very good asset manager. So, Flint, Michigan, has anybody heard of Flint, Michigan? There's a, no, good, okay. Very quick story, they wanted to save a whole lot of money. The, it was an industrial car plant town that had, in the Rust Belt of America that the car plants had moved and everybody was quite poor. Um, quite a large African American population as well. They weren't paying, or they were struggling to pay for the cost of their water. So they ended up with, the council got booted and there was an administrator and all these sorts of things. But they decided they were getting their water from the city of Detroit by a metre. It was excellent, high quality water, no problems with it all, just expensive. So they decided they would put in a regional water scheme um, with about five or six towns like this. And, that, and they had a good source of water and all of those sorts of things. And that would solve the problem, be a lot cheaper. Except being Americans, they, well, same happens in New Zealand, couldn't get the agreement. So they said to Detroit, no, we don't want your water anymore. Didn't renew the contract. Water's, you know, a year away from running out. This regional thing's, you know, 10 years away from getting built. So in their wisdom, and hopefully some engineers told them don't ever do that, they decided to get their water out of the Flint River, which had been polluted by car plants for 100 years. The water in the Flint River was so polluted that not even the car plants took water for their manufacturing processes out of it. To make matters worse, it's an older town in the US, and in the US they have a lot of towns that have lead service lines. So they pumped highly contaminated with heavy metals and industrial process water into a water system with some sort of treatment and didn't bother to treat for the changing conditions for the lead. So lead leached out of the service lines as a result of the water change and they picked it up because little African American children started showing signs of brain retardation and lead poisoning, which is irrecoverable. At that time, everything hit the fan. It got so bad, it was during Obama's presidency when it, when it became public, there were massive arguments in the US Congress about it, because quite, you know, uh, unfortunately the person that made all the decisions was, it was a white Republican, um, and, and so you had this, you know, you have poisoned five, six, seven, ten thousand African American children irrecoverably to save 25 million dollars. Um, and you can imagine the African American senators and congressmen and, and even the president. Um, it would be like a tiny wee town in New Zealand, I mean Flint is a, is a, is a speck in American city terms and you've got the Prime Minister and the, or the President and, and the Congress and the Senate all arguing about how bad your water is, it's not a good place to be. So what they did was they pushed the dollars down, they pushed the service levels down and that risk that they had which was hidden started rising until they found out about it. And what you have is this thing called a threshold of safety and trust with public assets. Bridge collapses, roads washing away, water supplies not, not being safe, all breach that. All of a sudden that risk becomes apparent. Everybody goes, oh, we've got a huge problem. Service levels are down here, dollars are down here. Then what happens is you poke lots and lots of dollars back in, you get the service levels back up over that, the, the threshold of safety, the risk that everybody's now very, very aware of comes down under that. So you're back on the right side of your threshold of safety, but you've lost trust for usually a generation, 30 or 40 years. You go and poison a whole lot of people, they're not going to trust you for a long time. People remember. In our societies, the Western societies, 
You will then have legislation, regulations, costs of alternative action, litigation, the overall societal cost, and inspections and investigations from, for, for the next 20 years. In some societies, if you did that, um, they would uh, execute you. Or at the very least, you would leave, lose your job and go to jail. Um, I'm not sure that anyone's gone to jail yet over Flint, but they are prosecuting people in the States. Now, the cost wasn't, so you did all that to save 25 million. The conservative estimate at the moment is over half a billion American dollars. And it will be higher than that because you've got lifelong care costs for 10,000 people. You've got massive litigation costs. They've got to, still got to build a decent war supply. And they've got to do, um, and right across the whole of New America now, there's now inspection regimes for every war supply that's got lead pipes. So it's become a whole of society costs as well. All to try and save 25 million. And that's, when you're an asset manager, those are the sorts of decisions when somebody says to you, if we go back to this lovely diagram back here, and somebody says, we haven't got enough money, if you drop the service level, the risk will go up, and if you don't advise what the consequences of that are, or the probable consequences are, you're not doing your job. Because the politicians are only interested in the three, four, five years that they're elected, and they won't, will not make another decision unless they're presented with compelling evidence. So this, is, this stuff is actually, yeah, it's real. Um, I'm picking on the Americans today. There's no Americans in the room, are there? No, good. So this is not what you want to see. This was the I-35W interstate bridge that collapsed in 2007 into the Mississippi. And 13 people died and 145 were injured. I think it was a couple of hundred million bucks to put it back. That's just the physical infrastructure. Several hundred vehicles a day went over that bridge. They were fixing it at the time it broke, by the way. They'd had heaps and heaps of inspections. Um, they knew they had a problem. They knew it was overloaded. They knew it was a design that had weak gusset plates that needed fixed. And the day it collapsed, they had a concrete mixer or a heavy construction plant trying to fix some stuff. They had um, all the materials on site, so they were putting more point load on the thing. And the one thing they didn't do, which they probably would have saved them, is they should have shut half the bridge off where they were fixing it, but they didn't want to hold the traffic up, so when a particularly heavy truck went over, at the same time all of that dead load was already on the bridge, it gave up. It said, not anymore, you're hurting me, boom, into the river. Now, that made New Zealand TV very embarrassing for the Americans, not, not, not the sort of thing you want to do. Factors of safety, how to model, how to communicate. So since that, by the way, the Americans have now instituted even more bridge inspections, but there's no money to fix bridges. I've got thousands, might even be over 10,000 bridges built in the 1960s that are at the end of their life that they can't find the money for fixing. So all they're doing is intensively inspecting them. If you, if you want a, a job that will keep you in pocket money for a very long time, become a bridge inspector in America because they're not going to fix them. They're just going to drop them one by one into rivers and things like that, or fix them at the last minute and try and inspect their way out of the problem. But anyway, that's what happens if you don't get risk right. Walkerton in Canada um, ended up, that was the impact. Uh, that was in 2000. We ended up with water safety plans, protection, source protection upgrades. Uh, long-term operations and maintenance costs and that here in New Zealand. Still didn't stop the next one happening, which is Havelock North, 2016. 5,000 plus L. Four deaths, but not directly attributable, you know, secondary causes, if you like. Um, what's coming out of that? Updated water safety plans, a lot more information. We will have increased regulation. By the end of this year, I suspect we should have a regulator. Uh, lots of increased compliance and quality control. So Hastings District now have triple the number of staff in that area that they used to. Um, increased long-term operations and maintenance costs and an increased level of service and an increased cost. But if you were a resident of Havelock North and you were 
sick for a week, which people were, from water that you drank that the council provided, you probably wouldn't be too happy. They weren't. In all fairness, Hastings District have worked extremely well with their communities and have not mucked around in terms of fixing the problem. So they're doing all right, but I know the people who were involved and they, didn't, they don't turn up to work on a Monday morning going, we want to make people sick, and they really probably would have wished an awful lot that it hadn't happened in the first place. And it's just around processes, quality, knowing what your risks are. So, conclusion on asset management plans. 20 plus year effort, lots of guidance, industry specific templates here in New Zealand. If you're working outside New Zealand, start with the IIMM and the ISO. Key, key issues are service levels, future demand and risk. Uh, your key inputs from that, that diagram with the gaps. You must understand your service levels, risks and hidden risks have to be considered. And that's hard because if it's hidden, you don't, nobody can see it. That's what requires the engineering intelligence and analysis to work it out. And then AMPs must be implemented and improved to be useful. Thank you for listening. Questions? I'm sure you're going to get exam questions on some of this stuff, so feel free to ask. The, the, this one? No, the river, river bridge. Oh, yeah, that's in Taranaki. <coughs> How do you justify funding for something like that? They sold it as an iconic um, addition to the Taranaki. And they got a lot of non council funding for it, which is fine for building the first one. Might be a problem when they go to f rebuild it in 100 years' time, but that's a long way away. How do you get. How do you get funding to build a Sydney Opera House? Same question. This this makes a this makes a lovely photo. Somebody was good at selling it, weren't they? And the, and the community. I mean, I think communities do want iconic structures, um, but it's how do you fund them and how do you justify them as the is the question. And, and I mean, the recent example of the fire in the, the church in France, I mean, if you were being pragmatic in engineering, you'd say, well, you know, there's a, we've got a very good bulldozer, it's a fantastic building site, and we could build something else there, couldn't we? And instead, they're going to spend 10 or 15 billion euros fixing up a 1,000-year-old structure it'll burn down again next time. So We're having the same argument in Christchurch with the Christchurch church in the square. You know, it's just wrecked. There are people that want it to be restored to where it was um, at huge cost. And, and, it, and it, that's a, it's not an engineering argument. That's a political argument between the community and the funders. Um, so... It's a nice bridge though. If you ever get the chance, go and walk across it. It's got a very interesting structure. So, right. Other questions? Yes. Um, so, how long not? I would have thought they would have had AMPs in place and controls in place. So, who are we talking about? Have Lock North. Have Lock North, yes, they did. Um, so, how does it get to the point where. It was an operational failure. And the trouble was, and, and I helped them with their asset plans, and I also helped them sign off their risk management prior to that incident. And um, I'm annoyed at myself at the one thing I missed, which after the incident was very, very obvious. So the problem is always around assumptions, okay? Because you never have all the information you need, and you always have to make assumptions. And in um, the whole of the Hawke's Bay, they have this marvellous aquifer, which for a hundred years has been pristine. Now, it's got bores from one... I've seen the map of all the bores. It's like, it's like a measles on a... On, it's just bores everywhere, because it's beautiful water and it's easy to get hold of. 
the fundamental assumption they had, and they, and they had no chlorine in the water because the water was pristine, because it's been pristine for 100 years, right? Christchurch has the same issue. And the assumption was that the water was pristine and would stay pristine. And that was incorrect. Okay? Now, they also did something else that, that is, is a warning sign for any engineer or asset manager. They built, so, so they'd had no chlorine in, but they recognised that they had a risk of contamination. So they actually had chlorinators at each bore site ready to chlorine if they, they needed to. The, the failure of imagination from an engineering point of view was once you know you've got contamination and turn the chlorine on, it's too late because you've already got contamination. So looking at it before the incident, you went, oh yeah, look, they've got bores, they've got good water, they've covered off the risk of contamination, they've got chlorination ready to go, but there's a lag between when contamination happens and when you know you've got contamination. And in that period, even if it's 24 hours, it's too late. People are, people are sick. Okay. Christchurch and Hutt Valley were both the same. Aquifer water, no chlorination, pristine water. Now, they had a warning shot 20 years ago where they had some contamination in that particular bore. It got lost. The information got lost in the organisation. They knew that that bore was getting old and they had built a new bore half a kilometre up the road. It got contaminated. So they went, oh, we don't want to turn on chlorination because the public don't want it. We will go back to the old bore. And that's, that, was the, that was one of the warning things that was missed. When you've decided something's old and it's ready to be retired, and you go and build something new over here, don't go back to the old. You've already made good decisions about that. But in that case, just for a short term, you know, 12 or 18 months while they sorted out what the contamination was over here, we'll go back to that one, bang. Okay, so yeah, they had very good, they've got very good asset managers, very good asset management plans. That was an operational, essentially an operational failure, but also a failure from the organisation to remember that they had an incident 20 years ago. That had been well documented. So, all based on an assumption that the war was pristine, which it isn't. But they've, they're not making that assumption anymore. So, yeah. So, so the thing is, and this is with any engineering, you can do a whole lot of things based on a set of assumptions that may not be valid. And climate adaptation and climate change is going to be a huge challenge in that regard because rainfall, sea levels, tide levels, storms that we have been used to for 100 years, there's enough evidence to suggest we're getting bigger ones of those and more frequent. Have to change your engineering. You can, you, we can, yeah, you can engineer out of those, but very, very expensive. Um, very, very hard in, in the Pacific because uh, small countries, not big economies. Um, an example, so the Christchurch, air, uh, Christchurch earthquake was a hit of around about 10% um, or maybe 15% of annual GDP for New Zealand the year it hit. And we're a relatively prosperous country and we had insurance against it and, and reserve funds and things like that. Now, when the big cyclone hit Vanuatu um, around about two or three years ago, um, it was 60% of the GDP damage. And a country that's not that prosperous relies on tourism and, and, and agriculture. So a much worse starting point and a much bigger hit. And there's actually some um, World Bank papers around showing that the Pacific is actually getting quite... percentage of GDP for these storms that are coming through is quite high for them. So it's a big problem. If, if New Zealand had an event that hit 60% of GDP, we'd probably feel, feel like we were dying as a country. And, and yet, you know, But there's aid flowing back into Vanuatu and stuff like that. So. Any more questions? <laughs>